Hello, everyone. Welcome to our, well, this is, I guess we're a Wednesday Q&A, but we're recording this and we're doing it on Thursday because Lynette did an interview with George Gammon. Which if you haven't watched it, watch it. Yep, which is, uh, will have been Wednesday and today is now Thursday. So it's not the Wednesday Q&A today, it's the Thursday Q&A. And uh, you submit your questions to us at questions at itmtrading.com. I take them, I put them on a uh, one sheet here on, on a screen, and I ask them to her live. She has not seen any of these questions. So you get a real organic response. So Dennis J asks, mm -hmm. you discussed on a recent program the record amount of SDRs distributed, 750 billion around the world. Mm -hmm. Can these SDRs be used by a government to purchase gold also, how are the SDRs converted into currency, and can a government convert SDRs into any currencies or just U.S. dollars? Great question. Uh, it's six hundred and fifty billion, and yeah, a government could indeed use them to buy gold or anything else because they did not put any parameters around them. In fact, Zimbabwe is using more than half of them, the ones that they will receive, to prop up their currency, which again is failing because they haven't changed behavior. So yes, they can use it for any purpose. There are no restrictions on that. Uh, and then how they convert it is actually the reason why the SDR kind of makes sense as being the world reserve currency, because it is a basket of currencies. So they do not have to convert it just into US dollars. They can actually convert it into any of the currencies that are part of that basket. So euros, yen, even yuan, et cetera. And, uh, and that's really how they do it. You know, they have these SDRs and then they can convert it to any of the currencies that are in there and then they can do whatever they want because those would all be kind of reserve currencies. Okay, so just so that's different, I think, right? Because didn't the ones that they issued in 09 and prior, it was only used to you couldn't really convert it to anything. You had to use it as a booster to your balance sheet only, right? No. No. They could use them but until you do convert them into one of the currencies that are in that basket, then it acts like ice cubes in a glass of right. water, making the reserves look more full. So they could always then utilize, they could actually spend them. Yes. And how would they spend them? Would they then take, take them back to the um, IMF and be like, here, I want to take these SDRs you just gave me and I want U.S. dollars instead. Well, they would go to the country, whatever currency they were going to do. So whether it's a U.S. dollar or the euro dollar or the yuan or whatever. So swap it with that respective country. And then swap country. it with that respective country. Got it. Now, you said also that Zimbabwe uses it to bolster their currency. How did they do you know how they did that? Uh, well, this is this is was I just read this article this morning, so I have to do a little more research on it. But we've, you know, I've been reading articles about Belarus using the current, using the SDRs and, and actually even Afghanistan, you know, what they're going to do with their SDRs. So I need to do a little more research on that to see how they're going to bolster their currency because they say that they're not going to use the SDRs or that distribution to pay down any foreign debt and that um, because of all the foreign debt that they still owe, that that is what has locked them out of the global market, the global bond market. But um, I would imagine that they could convert it to any one of the currencies and buy their Zimbabwe dollars. They could buy their own currency back. Correct. And then that would support their currency. Interesting. Um, okay, so John D.K. It's asks... It's all a Ponzi scheme, really. <laughs> I mean, you know, where where is the... Right, where what is... What is that the, called? Three Card Monty. Three Card... That's what it's called, yeah. It, it really is, you know. How funny we <laughs> both knew what you were talking about. <laughs> so did okay. everybody else watching, <clears throat> right. probably. So John D.K. asks, My wife thinks that credit unions are outside the system enough and are safer than big banks. Is this true? Um, in my opinion, no, because the credit unions are actually dependent upon 
the commercial big banks. That's where they get all their liquidity from. So, and they would, they were not deemed too big to fail before. I'm pretty sure they would not be deemed too big to fail now. So I do not consider them outside of the system at all. And if you recall, when um, the Fed set up those Fed Now accounts in October, so almost a year ago, uh, they were set up not just through the banks, but also through the credit unions uh, and actually even through postal services in the more rural areas. So no, it's all part of the system. Well, and I remember too, because back in 09, 08, 09, I remember we were following the, the, the failing banks on a regular basis and credit unions were also in there. Absolutely. Right now, you know, obviously <clears throat> JP Morgan and Bank of America, too big to fail, but all the ones that weren't deemed too big to fail were failing, whether they were credit unions or, or regular banks. Exactly, because they didn't really care. Though I will also say that had one more small, could have been a very small bank or credit union failed, the FDIC admitted that they would not have been able to continue to hide the fact that their diff fund, so their, their fund for the failing banks to pay creditors, pay the, the depositors, if even one more had failed, they would not have been able to keep it hidden and everybody would have known they were out of money. Yeah, but you Good know they kept it hidden. Then the the Federal Reserve just printed money and given it to the FDIC and said, "Then you know, probably go give these, go give this to the banks." Probably we don't want anybody to know this is a Ponzi scheme. Let's just print it. <laughs> All right. So Bridget H asks, "How do you transfer any gold and silver reserves into the new digital currency after the reset?" Now, I know this this is this is a question we've answered before. But we, I, we get it a lot. And I think it's a lot of That's our new okay. viewers who haven't seen the stuff we've talked about in right. the past. So I, we get this a lot. So I wanted to ask it again. So how do you Absolutely. transfer these gold and silver reserves into but, the new digital currency? Okay. But I, <clears throat> but I also want you to realize that on average, it takes a person hearing and seeing and smelling the same thing seven times before it starts to make sense. So well, I'm, I'm good smelling. with me. <laughs> But seeing and hearing, I'll go in. Good. I needed a little bit of levity. <laughs> After the, the going game the, interview, yeah. Yeah, I mean, not really. Um, <laughs> I'm still digesting it, frankly. But um, it, it's really simple. Because there's the broadest base of buyer, there's constantly demand. Now, if you're working with a good dealer like us, we will buy it back from you and voila, and you have you the, the new digital, digital currency. currency. Yeah. So that part is actually very, very easy. All right, so perfect. So mm -hmm. Kathy H asks, I have purchased gold and silver from ITN. Thank you, Kathy. I would like you I would like to know your thoughts regarding purchasing treasury bills with the money I have to keep in the bank for short-term immediate use and put that uh, for uh, monthly bills and property taxes. What's your thoughts on basically buying treasury bills for the excess? Um, well, I mean, they're not going to not pay them cuz they'll just create money to do that. And I would say if it's really is short term, but I would also say that it will not help you pay your property taxes intermediate and long term because obviously, well, maybe it's not so obvious, but during these kinds of resets, remember that's how, that's how municipal and state governments get their money is through property tax payments. So those have a tendency to go up pretty substantially. So if it really is for a very short term, then you're, you're probably okay. Um, you know, is it better although, than keeping cash in the bank? That, it's, that's probably, a. Uh, you know, look, the whole system is so vulnerable and so fragile. And, you know, we've had some issues around liquidity in the treasury markets even recently. And you've got the reverse repos. You know, I mean, that whole issue, the money market funds and the plumbing of the system is rearing its ugly head. I mean, I don't know how to answer. I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, I don't think any of that is safe. Do I keep is cash in the bank? Is it better than cash in the bank? Would you Would than... you rather have treasury bills than cash in the bank? Well, if it really is short term, then, you know, I mean, and because I'm running a business, I do have cash in the bank. But I also have cash out of the bank, which 
if I need to do it, I can always make that deposit because when this thing blows and nobody knows exactly the moment that that the central banks will determine that it is too expensive to do or the public loses complete confidence. And this is a really big issue, as we saw from the report from the House of Lords and the Bank of England, is that that central banks are really losing their credibility when it comes to this transitory inflation. And they wonder why the public is losing that confidence. And, and that's what's going to keep the system together, is that confidence. So they're losing the confidence because because the inflation is running hot enough for people to notice. You know, two percent, yeah, people don't really notice over a year, right? But seven, eight, ten percent, twelve percent, it becomes very noticeable. So, like rents here in Phoenix. Yeah. I mean, I talk to people, and it's like it's gone up twenty percent a year. People yeah. Know, people notice that for sure. They notice that for sure. And it's not just here in Phoenix. That is actually happening, you know, on a countrywide basis and even a global basis. You know, and I did I did ask George some real estate questions before we went on air, which actually we're going to put out in our podcast. So you guys might want to listen to them because by the time we got on air, we did not have any time to focus on anything other than you know, what we, what we discussed. So if it really is short term, you can do treasury bills or you can do, but you're probably going to get a negative rate on treasury bills, or you can do cash in the bank. Either one of them would probably work ish, but you definitely need to have cash completely out of the system because you can always make a deposit. You just can't always make a withdrawal. All right. Um, hey, can you, Edgar, can you scroll down to the the other one there? Yeah. Okay. From Sari's client, Mark, what does she mean by hyperinflation is currently held in the debt market? What is a cash alternative to money markets if held in banks? So two questions. So two questions. So the first question is, and it's not just held in debt markets, it's also held in stock markets, and it's also held in the real estate market, because those were the markets that the central banks targeted for reflation. And so all of that hyperinflated money that they've created, and I've shown you those charts and graphs a gazillion times, and we'll continue to do that a gazillion times more. Right now, all of that hyperinflation is held inside of those markets. That's why you see the stock market constantly making new highs. However, when people get nervous and they attempt to liquidate, well, you're going to see you're going to see halts, so you're not going to be able to do it so easily. But that money could definitely flood into the real markets, so or into the real economy. So that's what I mean. So you're that, saying it's pent up. Oh, I'm totally it's saying pent it's up pent hyper up hyperinflation. Correct. H h kind of well, held in the debt markets. Yes. Like it's there it's, and it's just kind of being held back. Correct. Got it. Yes. Okay. That, that makes sense. That's what that's what I'm saying. That's why when they go, well, look at how much we've we've new money we've created since 2008 and it hasn't caused inflation. In fact, forever they couldn't even meet their their two percent inflation target which was interesting when they announced they were going to go to average. And I said at that time, oh, watch, they're setting us up for high inflation so they can justify not, you know, not fighting it. But fighting it is really kind of interesting because in order to fight inflation, they raise interest rates so that fewer people borrow and spend. In Brazil, they have raised interest rates and raised them and raised them like, like every month to fight inflation, yet the public there still expects even higher inflation, and they're going, oh, how come? Maybe because it's a lot higher than even where they've raised their rates. And that is an indication of a loss in confidence. And once that confidence is lost, you're, you're not getting it back. And I think that that is really something that we're going to see happening on a global basis, you know, because here we actually have a central bank that is raising rates to at least attempt to fight the inflation. But all of that 
new money that is pent up in those markets, I mean, I, they're losing control. So I believe the central banks are definitely losing control. So this statement kind of comes really well on the back of that hyperinflate. Oh, let's go back because they asked another question and we only answered one. Oh, okay. What is the cash, cash alternative, alternative to, to money, money markets, markets have held in the banks? Is it treasuries? Because we just talked about savings that. Savings accounts. <laughs> Well, treasuries will have an end date, so you can do super short treasuries, but that would really just be cash in a checking or a savings account would be a money market alternative because money markets are made up of, of commercial paper and, you know, and a lot of other things, short-term debt, sometimes a little bit longer-term debt, so it could be treasuries, it could be this or it could be that. If you really need something where you need to access it like immediately, then you go to cash and you stay in cash. But um, yeah, money markets are actually really risky these days, really risky with what's because of all this massive amount of new money that has been created. The markets just can't. It's, it's kind of like filling up a glass with water. You know, at some point when you get to the rim, if you keep filling it, the water's going to spill over. And that's really what's happening right now. All right. So I, I thought this was important. So it's not a question, but Gary A. is in Lebanon. He's, he mm -hmm. says, I'm contacting you from Beirut, Lebanon, where hyperinflation is already happening. Mm -hmm. I just wanted you to notice one thing and tell your audience because you may not have realized its importance. You, you always say we need food, water, energy, community, etc. Mm -hmm. I have secured all that, but I rushed even more to secure medicine. Mm -hmm. There is plenty Absolutely. of food if you have cash in Lebanon, but rich or poor, you cannot find enough medicine. So I thought that was super important I, as one of your is. preps, especially if you have... If you have diabetes or asthma you have or a chronic, any chronic illness and stock up on, you know, stock up on medicine. He said, too, that um, you got to pay attention to the expiring dates, the expiration dates, because, you know, some of that stuff goes beyond it's, that. And you want to make sure that you have enough to, you know, get by for a, a, for a period, period of time. Right. I, I, absolutely. And actually, that is part of the strategy is to find out if you have any kind of chronic illnesses that you have to make sure that you do have enough meds for a prolonged period of time. Additionally, when you are growing, so I, I you're right, Gary, and I'll, I'll talk about that a lot more because I've done some things on it where you can see this, the medicine shelves, the pharmacy shelves go bare and you cannot get those meds. Uh, part of what I've done is in my planting, planted medicinal plants. And I just was on with Marjorie yesterday and um, they're big into that as well. So there are, are ways to handle the medicine but generally speaking, if you have a chronic illness, then yeah, you're at 100% right. You have to secure your medicine. Yep. All right, well, that's it for the questions for the week. What do you got for um... next week? Uh, so I was on with the Grow Network, Marjorie Wildcraft, and uh, the link is in. Okay, so the link to this interview is out already, and I really enjoyed her, and I want to have her on. I think she's really an expert. She's been growing this network and this community for a very long time, and they really are all about growing food, medicine, all of that. So uh, a lot of value there. And is her name Wildcraft, or is yes. that, or is that just happened to be part of her? No, I is that her that YouTube is, name? I'm wow, pretty okay. sure that's her name. Huh, that's cool. Pretty sure that's her name. And uh, she was an engineer by training and really have, has noticed what's been going on with the world and the global economy and all of that. And so she started this quite some time ago and she's really quite good. And today I had that coffee with Lynette, with George Gammon, which in my personal opinion was probably the single most important interview that I have done since we started this channel and probably even before that honestly probably I, I'd probably say probably the single most important interview I've done in my life you definitely want to watch that if you haven't watch it again and share 
you know, all of these, you know, ignorance does not make us immune. It just leaves us vulnerable. And this is not the time to be vulnerable. Things are changing and happening so quickly that, you know, you, you've got to be prepared to deal with lots of things. And we've got to come together as community and make a stand. And we'll talk more about that um, as we move forward. But next week, I'll be back on with my friend Jake Ducey and I Love Prosperity. And uh, it's been a little while, so I'm really looking forward to those conversations. He, he typically people, asks some pretty good questions. People like your interviews with him. So. Yep, yep. Always, He always makes me think, you know. So if you are ready, and I hope you are, because honestly, you need to be ready to create your own strategy. And if you want to schedule some time with one of our consultants that have been all trained, I mean, we're all executing the same strategy, just kind of tweaked to make sure that it suits you and your circumstance and your goals, et cetera, just schedule a Calendly meeting and you'll find the link in the description or, or you can call us and the number is on the screen or I can just tell you 888-696-4653. But, you know, this is definitely the time to be subscribed because again, a lot, a lot of moving parts. So if you like this, please give us a thumbs up. Make sure you leave a comment and share, share, share. And as always, it is 100%. Please, people, cover your assets. And until next week, no, until, yeah, until next week, be safe out there. Bye-bye.